The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Can a person be of two minds and thus not be accused of contradicting himself with diametrically different points of view? Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. On December 30th, 2013, I presented my 10 predictions for the coming year of 2014, and listening to them again today, they sounded pretty optimistic. The show is available on our website, and I encourage you to listen again simply because I can't argue with what I said, and I think much of it is coming true. To summarize, the 10 included number one, references to the 100th monkey theory, intelligence spheres, and the concept of memes carrying the notion of NDEs to a far wider audience in 2014. And I think that has happened. One big example was the movie version of Heaven is for Real and the impact that had on people's thinking about NDEs. Number two, the ongoing advancements in resuscitation make for many more reports of NDEs and OBEs and patients being much more willing to tell others about what they saw on the other side. And my own personal experience with uh, uh, people in the hospital uh, seems to make this uh, so. Number three was the the number of credible scientists, philosophers, and doctors who've begun some serious studies of NDEs, OBEs, and the nature of consciousness in ways that intersect with spiritual understanding as well. Number four was related to the last, and inasmuch as science now appears to be ready to come to grips with studying phenomena heretofore considered uh, to be too far out, too spiritual or mystical to be experimented with. Number five uh, concerns a cultural shift in which legalistic religions seem to be conceding to personal, mystical, and spiritual understanding as a way of growth for perhaps millions of Americans. Six was about the role being played by quantum physics in our growing understanding of how the mystical works. Seven was the discovery of the Higgs boson particle at the linear accelerator in CERN. Uh, This so-called God particle is what gives mass to matter, what makes it possible to live in the material world, what made the Big Bang do what the Big Bang did, and uh, all that followed, including the duality between matter and spirit. Eight and nine concern the contribution science fiction has made to the complexity of spiritual understanding. And ten reflected on Pope Francis' resolve to change the direction of Catholicism as well as other signs and works in some other faiths. And that has certainly been uh, coming true during the year and just in the last few days. Um, We're being led away from religious law and toward greater, more spiritual love, uh, spiritual spiritual maturity, if you will. So, okay, those were my predictions from a year ago, and I'm not backing down from them. I, I hope you'll go back and listen to the full program from December 30th, 2013. My predictions for 2015, however, uh, I haven't even numbered them, because, uh, and I think they'll sound a whole lot grimmer than last year's. And I say this because it gets uh, to where we must go. We we'll probably have to go through a hell like Bardo right here in this material world. Let's consider for a moment people's reactions to the bad news in the world. One of the tenets shared by both fundamental Christians and New Agers is the idea that all we need to do is believe and everything else will fall into place. There are some differences, of course, in the understanding of what that means, The fundamental Christians would say we're saved by faith, not by works. In other words, just by believing Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you will go to heaven. New Agers, on the other hand, to use a loose and very broad term, would say that God loves us without condition and is ready to embrace anyone who wants to go into the light, be they Christian, pagan, Wiccan, or no religion at all. For both groups, then, you are saved by belief, not by what you do or don't do. Jesus, on the other hand, tells us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And that's Matthew chapter 7, 21. That would seem to demolish the fundamentalist point of view. And to the New Agers, Jesus would remind them of the parable about separating the sheep 
who helped and loved other people from the goats who did not help or love other people. It would seem then that what we do in this world, in this life, counts for a lot in the hereafter. There are dark places in the bardo, and for some endy ears as well. Call them self-inflicted punishments if you must, but even so, better not uh, to attempt to go into the light when you're awash in a sea of guilt and sin. That life review can be a bummer. Some say God made hell for those who fall short. Some say we all fall short, and a loving God would not send anyone to hell. Meanwhile, many people in this world say we have made this life a hell for others in trying to avoid it for ourselves. And they say it's proved with every broadcast of the evening news. Some New Agers say we are gods ourselves, and if that's true, then we are the gods who made hell. And so a hell by our own hands is a distinct possibility. In Plato's Republic, the soldier Ur tells us that heaven and hell exist, but they are not eternal states of being. We only pass through them before we reincarnate into our next life. Perhaps the suffering in the world today will be punishment enough, and the light will be waiting for us all on the other side, or maybe not. Even endy ears get only a partial glimpse of what's in store for us, and maybe our judgment comes only after we go through many lifetimes with many circumstances to test us. Anyway, I believe 2015 will be one of those testing years. So what are the tests we face? Oh, we all know about them, but we hardly ever relate them so closely to our own lives as to change our personal behavior. They include matters of world hunger, killing, greed, corporate exploitation, and the cruelty we deal out to one another in all its forms. Just to do something a bit differently, I thought I'd present in rhyme a pastiche of some of the issues we must confront and overcome in order to heal this world. So here are several poems about the state of the world today, as written by my old friend, Dr. Doggerall. We are going to begin with uh, one titled, A Billion Starve, A Billion Fat. Isn't it an awful puzzle that we have to practically muzzle our mouths from taking all the bites it takes to gorge our appetites? with food that makes us grow ginormous. Meanwhile, commercials sing a chorus in our mail or flows with offers that, for hundreds of dollars from our coffers, companies will deliver thinness. Thinness, now a major business in our land, while understand that just a few miles down the road, hunger has a stranglehold on children and the elderly, the poor whose waists may not look thinner than some who stuff down every dinner, are walking nutritional deficits. The food they eat is full of hits like fructose sugars, GM starch, that fuels them onward as they march the bad food road to health disasters. Death's their only way to greener pastures. A billion people in our world are overweight, while perhaps you've heard a billion border on starvation. In Bangladesh, let us vacation, or Haiti, as a prime example where dirty water, starch spread thin, leaves little extra on their chin while kids pick garbage dumps for treasure, a few cents a day, their incomes measure. 300 years or so ago, Jonathan Swift served a swift blow proclaiming the wealthy English eat Ireland's only produce, baby meat. He wrote it as a satire, sure, but corporations now do lure us down the path to franken food, genetic horrors just as rude as cannibalism. Don't you see the fast food ads on your TV show the end game to our nutritional story? Could eating babies be more gory? A sci-fi movie, Soylent Green, some years ago proposed the theme that in the future we would eat a product made from ground-up meat of those who died. Dead folks' last gift. A protein shake to give a lift to the living left, if life you call it. If you want better, please help stall it before corporations go too far. Too far. Let's eat organic, eat much less. Share the wealth and health. Confess we have enough good food to feed the planet. Well, frankenfood, we must now ban it. So there's one poem dealing with uh, hunger and uh, the uh, misallocation of food in the world. Here's one about anger. These are all just intrinsic problems in the world that we have to overcome. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Anger does not equate with truth by Dr. Doggerl. 
Anger does not equate with truth. If you are going through the roof because you hate your neighbor's cat or wife, look over where you're at because as anger starts to rise, our skill at clouding truth with lies to blot those illuminating rays that God gave us to cut the haze grows larger with each lie we rant till grasping truths just what we can't. This anger in us grows and grows till we no longer can compose a sentence free from vitriol, a word of peace that might forestall the loading on of all frustrations that haunt our brains on such occasions that day when Daddy whomped your ass because his rage just wouldn't pass, and he took out all his frustrations on you, victim of his ruminations about the cruelty of life, or perhaps he stabbed you with a knife due to rage his father hadn't hid. Those sins fly back. Forgive. Forbid continuing hurts your parents did, or boss, or priest, or wife, or friend. This crushing anger must now end because we project it on each other, on loved ones, friends, our son or brother, all the victims of the lie. We tell ourselves to justify screaming F you at those we love while Satan sneers at God above. For us to call such anger truth and righteous our going through the roof is perhaps the cruelest joke of all. To justify our spiritual fall by thinking rage could clear the mind, that screaming is the way to find what we are lacking in our soul. Freedom ain't losing self-control, but controlling self through kindly thoughts and loving acts. That's where truth stalks, and out's the bull we tell ourselves. The hells we make from past hurts shelved and kept on hand for rants and rages while we lose our monsters from their cages. The right wing does collective fury with Glenn Beck, Limbaugh, judge and jury. They hate the government, the poor, the migrant worker, Cuba, Moore, the welfare mother paying taxes, and they claim truth despite what faxes. The left wing, angry, also speak, and they won't turn the other cheek about Obama's compromising with political realities not surprising to anyone who knows politics, change gets said, but seldom sticks. Truth is not in grasping, holding. Truth's in the quiet, the unfolding of God's love in human hearts. Sadly, we speak, we speak through other parts with lying tongues and heads up asses. The quiet truth of love just passes out of mind and out the door while we're left crying on the floor, mouthing justice, losing love while fury reigns and not the dove. And I'm just going to go on with, uh, with more of this because it's, uh, it's, uh, a way of expressing what we have to overcome in the world before we can see that evolution that we're all hoping for. This one's titled, Is Violence Intrinsic to Our Human Nature? by Dr. Doggerel. Is violence intrinsic to our human nature? Does matter contain both the love and the hate you're liable to think of when asked that question? Well, let's look at the matter to ask who'll invest in the notion that matter might just self-destruct, leaving us mortals, no doubt, out of luck. The Bible says God formed our bodies of clay, and science has not made that thought go away, but matter's quite stable. It takes nuclear bombs or aldron accelerators to bring particles to harm, except there is one thing that couldn't be sadder. That's an encounter with cruel antimatter, the thing that can bring on complete annihilation. It was made at the Big Bang. It's the very gestation of making something from nothing, and when anti completes us, we're again back to zero. Non-existence defeats us. But above basic matter, does biology teach that we can aspire beyond violence to reach a sweetness in life that brings true harmony, a oneness with nature that lets us be free to explore our potential in God's universe, a life without pain wherein we can rehearse the music of green trees and God's loving critters? But then we look round and it gives us the jitters to think that our deaths most inevitable are Biologic clocks end us, our telomere bar from ant, leaf, and me to the sweet croaking frog. We all die someday, giant elm, rotten log. 
Other faiths say we're stuck on the wheel. We reincarnate often like life's no big deal. Our mothers, our daughter, and some life down the line, and we fantasize karma will bring us out fine till we ponder the fact that we hardly improve in this life or the next. We're unlikely to move into moral empowerment as we better our station. Temptations, corruptions spoil our recreation until we incarnate as stones or as vermin without God's forgiveness. Karma can't determine a path that is upward and moral and true. Life's the tar baby story. We get stuck through and through. Then what about spirit? And after we die, is there peace found at last in our home in the sky? On earth as in heaven, Jesus taught us to pray. Is heaven the place where there's no more decay? The battling's over and there's God's peace? Does our suffering at last gain eternal release? But what about warring in heavenly places? The Bible describes angels turning their faces from God's light and love while archangels rage as war with the demons who fell off the stage at the beginning of time, and they still rage today. Do our souls join that battle? Do we enter that fray as the reward for our living and dying on earth? Do we just get promoted to some upper berth where the war then continues between love and the other? Does destruction go on between brother and brother in heaven as on earth? Is that the true read? of our earthly-born burdens of violence and greed? The duality problem is intrinsic to nature. It came with creation, and it's there at each stage you're expected to deal with from matter to spirit, anti-matter to death. We all know we know something will queer it when it comes to perfection. It just never ends. It just never comes. When we think we've gained heaven, then some awful bums impose on our reverie when we least expect it. We want to lose violence, but just can't reject it. It comes built right into duality's core. Between good and evil, there'll always be war until existence is ended, and we're back to zero, where there's never the villain and never the hero, just the oneness of God in which we'll be infused, inconceivable oneness, and no longer abused. This one's titled... The priest prayed to Yahweh to send them a sign by Dr. Doggerel. The priests prayed to Yahweh to send them a sign, so God sent them cancer. A sign to the blind, the world's now so polluted that our bodies are too. We are dying of toxins, but get shots for the flu, because we won't face the truth of what pollution can do. The priest prayed to Yahweh to send them a sign, so God turned the Mexican Gulf into slime, the blood-red pollution of BP's foul do- deed, the fish killed, the birds died on account of their greed. So they sunk the red toxin and killed sea coral, too. Why not kill it all? It's the least we can do. All the oceans will turn red before we are through. The priest prayed to Yahweh to send them a sign and Hundreds of coal miners died in the mines uncontrolled by inspectors paid off by the owners who abhor regulation. Hey, we're capitalist loners. Just leave us alone to get rich on the others. We'll climb to the top over bodies of brothers and sisters who die on account of our greed. Coal is our life's blood, so the miners must bleed. The priests prayed to Yahweh to send them a sign, and God sent Big Pharma, kings of white-collar crime who sell dangerous pills, For thousands of bucks whose side effects poison, this system just sucks the life out of patients. Even placebos could save. At least plain placebos don't put them in the grave, but doctors are lied to by big pharma sellers. They work for their bonus, and and lying's their compeller. Funeral Directors Association, the new FDA, all in big pharma's pockets, so drugs are the way... We rob from the sick until their dying day. The priests prayed to Yahweh to send them a sign, and birds fell from the sky. Perhaps they had dined on gene-altered crops from Monsanto and such, round up frankenfoods like they serve us for lunch, and we too may fall like the birds and the fish. We just can't acknowledge the priests got their wish decades ago, but they went with the money instead of defending God's world when it that sunny and bright agriculture was balanced with nature when we all 
planted food and thank God for the favor of tending his Eden, but instead we destroyed it. We keep looking for hope. As for change, we avoid it. Still, change is the sign Yahweh looks for in us. He sent all his signs. There's nothing more to discuss except who to name in our will when we die. And there are aliens among us who won't even cry when we wipe ourselves out with our toxins and greed. Will they be the heirs who will finally succeed in restoring the earth from our poisonous deed? Here's one. Dr. Doggerel visits the guru. I had to know the answer. I had to find out why. That wars go on and hate and fear and why we have to die. I climbed the guru's mountain. I was not afraid to fall. The need to know was growing strong. The cliffs so tall and valley deep below called death a momentary chill that I would ask the truth to find by climbing this steep hill. The wise man sat by his cave door, an illuminating smile briefly crossed his lips. He said, you've climbed up many a mile to find what you already know. The thought you had down there below was wise beyond your years. This climb you've made before, of course, and you have cried these tears each time we learn by our mistakes, but then the truth of memory breaks, and we do it all again. Commit our sins, say our amen, and plunder, torch, and kill. You knew this climbing up the hill that you've been here before. Your eyes have seen, you've looked between the threshold and the door, and you've beheld the wisdom that we repeat these sins. We start out strong, but then go wrong. And then technology wins. We love our toys. We love the noise, our pleasures, and our sins. We started in a garden with that immortal tree to eat the fruit of life itself was uh, was what was meant to be. Instead, we chose the evil fruit of knowledge and of power. We learned to die by Satan's lie. It happened in an hour, and now we're trapped on karma's wheel. Our souls have failed to flower. Cain built the very first cities, invented the machine, until a grand Atlantis, the human's only dream, the comforts of technology lulled everyone to sleep. But greed and hatred ruled our hearts, insidious and so deep that warring with our neighbors the only way to keep uh, our minds from self-destructing, from the mirror's awful truth, that technology can't save the day. Our toys are not the proof that we're entitled to the prize since we have built a roof of stuff to hide the sky above. The truth of God, the truth of love, were cut off from the source, of course. Our very hand, the hand of man, enacted this divorce. And so the Tower of Babel fell, like lovely Eden gone to hell. Atlanta's shining city sunk beneath the waves, a fatal dunk, brought on perhaps by nuclear war, Yes, yes, we've seen it all before. The old texts tell the story. The Mahabharata, India's glory, describes the flying war machines, describes the flash, the rotting flesh, the ending then of our cruel dreams of conquering everyone but ourselves, and exactly what that means. Even the Bible tells the tale of Babel and its fall when the world spoke one great language and we built a tower so tall, the Internet heard round the world Communications flag unfurled until disaster by our hands scattered people from the lands. The high-tech world fell once again, and destruction reigned on Sodom's men, not for sex, but DNA. Manipulation underway in technology's hands, just like today. The guru paused and asked, Do you suppose that we will now pull through and somehow save the oceans, trees, from dying from the same disease we've spread before? We've opened up this door again. The forest freedom at an end, the ocean now awash with oil, the very air we breathe is spoiled. The animals and plants are dying, and about all this we go on lying. You know the truth, the guru said. Now bring it from your heart and head and spread the word. Feel Noah's dread and build an ark against the storm. Preserve what's true. Forget the norm. The stuff you love is our disaster. The radical change is coming faster than you could possibly foresee. Embrace the truth and be set free from trying to save that which is lost. Our greed has triumphed. Damn the cost of environment, sanity, the whole world, except 
perhaps one remnant hurled like Noah to start it all again. Or perhaps not. If this time the end is the last time, God will be Earth's friend. And here's the last one. It's true, you know, we never die by Dr. Doggerel. It's tr true, you know, we never die. This matrix world is not a lie, but a promise made of things to come. The return to where we all come from, stripped of the baggage from this world, this chaos into which we're hurled when naked, embodied, we arrived from mother's womb where magnified from sperm and egg we took our form and assumed the earth to be the norm. Why do we lose the understanding? Is it that life is so demanding we can't accommodate the love we learned and knew from up above? That sea of love is what we need to make this angry world succeed, but it's as elusive as the mist. When we left God, we were dismissed with an abrupt loss of memory and ignorance to make us free. Plato taught reincarnation follows death. The heavenly stations reserved for those who've learned pure love and merge with God like hand and glove. No longer needing, no returning, the struggle over, no more yearning to individuality. They give up ego to be free. But holding back, you're born again until you learn to say Amen. Plato described a man named Ur whose death in battle did occur, and he with the other dead did go to heavenly fields through which did flow the river of forgetfulness, where those who die do bathe unless they've died too soon and must return. Near deaths, I guess, the way we learn what waits for us beyond the grave, those memories we need to save. It's true, you know, we never die. The soul eternal flies on high as the body finally crashes down. The body fails, the soul is sound and carries memories, deeds, and fears, the pain we caused, and all the tears that we inflicted on the others, the sin we did to sisters, brothers, friends, and parents, lovers, children, the hurt we caused can be bewildering. During the life review we face, our cruelty then, now our disgrace. We all await a life review. It covers everything we do, and so we should avoid the hurt we cause today. This soul alert is posted simply as a warning. Accept that fact, and in the morning start another better journey. Your soul can't hire an attorney to defend it on the final day, but your own opinion has a say, and you may be your own worst judge if the weight you bear is too much to budge. So that encapsulates, I think, my predictions for what we'll be going through in 2015. We le must learn to heal ourselves and heal the world, and, uh, and then we can move on with a little more grace and uh, security than I think we face today. I'm wishing you a happy new year, of course. And uh looks like we're just about out of time for today. If you'd like to listen to this or any of our past shows again, just go to our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about the work of IANDS, check out their website, iands.org. And tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>